Good evening, everybody. I remain Larry Mason, former college professor for eight years and a computer system administrator for 30 years. I still feel very obligated to Michael Shanklin and all those who help him bring you the Voluntary Virtues Network. Without such generosity, you would not be hearing my voice. I enjoy lecturing as much as any professor, but I will have more fun when our live shows draw some guests so listeners can ask questions and correct my errors. However, for the next several weeks, we must make do with these pre-recorded lectures. This speech is the 62nd in the Invisible Hand series of talks, all of which involve money in one way or another. Invisible Hand is also the name of the novel, which I hope this series of talks will inspire you to read if you have not already done so. Reading or listening to it will cost you only time, since it is freely available on the Internet in both text and MP3 formats at nopomstuff.info. Or, if you're willing to spend a dollar on Amazon, you can download the whole novel to your Kindle. That's as commercial as I'll get. Tonight's topic is a question asked by one of our show's listeners. It's about time we started getting some audience participation. Interaction is better with multiple points of view. Our listener wants to understand more about the bureaucracy of the proposed non-POM system and the voting. Clearly, this refers to the bureaucracy of those who calculate, determine, discover the earnings each person will have credited to his or her account each pay period. Fortunately, the process is rather simple in concept, though it can get rather complicated in execution. There are a few points of context which we must establish before the details of my explanation will make sense. Recall that with non-POM, the total amount of money that exists in the computer accounts is a close approximation of the total amount of luxury goods and services available for sale. That is, if all the luxury goods and services were bought one month, it would take all the non-POM then existing to buy them. When a luxury item or service is bought or redeemed, the money used ceases to exist and the item is no longer for sale. Thus, when people use their money, the total money supply decreases as the total number of things for sale decreases. There is a corresponding process which exactly mirrors this decrease in luxuries and money. When those who produce luxury items and services make them available for sale, a corresponding amount of money comes into existence so that those goods and services can be purchased or redeemed. Thus, when a luxury is produced, the money to buy it comes into existence as a result. The payer bureaucracy is necessary in order to determine or calculate the amounts of money which should come into existence in the various accounts of individuals who have earned it. Naturally, there will no longer be any such thing as joint accounts nor accounts for organizations or other non-person entities, not even corporations. In order to gather the data to make these calculations, the work of millions of people must be coordinated, organized, made predictable, and standardized. In other words, social organizations, which we label bureaucracies, must be used. For large-scale activities, bureaucracies are the most efficient social organizations that human beings have invented thus far. If something more efficient comes along, that will likely be used in place of the bureaucracy. But until then, one has to expect that the data collection procedures will be organized in a bureaucracy. This bureaucracy need not be composed exclusively of payers. I would expect that many people would spend at least a part of their time gathering data, converting it into information which can be useful, and presenting that information in regular ways to those payers actually making payment decisions. For example, a sales clerk in a clothing store may swipe a barcode reader over a garment when that garment is given to a customer. That data, the garment characteristics, the customer who will assume possession or ownership, the whole production chain of individuals who contributed to the manufacture of that garment, will then be available in the database of the pr property computer system, which is a part of the payer bureaucracy infrastructure. The clerk, even though not a payer, has therefore served the payer bureaucracy by that action, and is, thus, a part of the bureaucracy, even though the use of the barcode reader may take up only a few minutes each workday. When private corporations withhold employee pay for federal or state income tax with POM, they are serving the government bureaucracies even though they are not government officials. Because of this, the people who constitute a working staff of the payer bureaucracy may be difficult to determine. Obviously, those who work full-time doing tasks important to the organization would be staff members. But then, only a relatively few people who are not payers would be likely to spend all their time on such work. Bureaucracies in palm economies are top-down command hierarchies. 
that is, the CEO and other top-level executives give their orders to those who report to them, and the commands trickle down through the organization to those who do the actual work of the bureaucracy. This is not the way that bureaucracies in a non-POM economy will function. Executives in a non-POM economy cannot fire anyone. They can, as simple individuals, refuse to work with other individuals. But in a bureaucracy, that would not prevent everyone else in the organization from continuing to work with those individuals. Thus, the CEO and other office holders in the organization simply cannot punish anyone for lack of obedience. Obviously, none of the non-POM bureaucracy's office holders controls the pay of members of the organization, since that power belongs exclusively to the payers. So the only way the executives can gain power or increase their own earnings is to do as good a job as they can at helping others to accomplish their tasks. One might say that the CEO of a building contractor is an assistant for each of the bricklayers and plumbers on the job. Those folks doing the actual construction are the ones who determine the quality of the work done. So the CEO maximizes earnings for everyone by providing the best support possible for those guys with the tools in hand. The payer bureaucracy is mostly composed of payers with some others who help out. In the non-POM bureaucracy, also, there is no command structure. Instead, there is a coordination structure. Yes, some payers may have roles which include making decisions about how things are to be done. But those decisions are accepted only so long as it seems to the staff that they are correct and appropriate. Each worker from floor sweeper on up is completely responsible for what they do, regardless of who told them to do it. Those decision-makers want to be overruled or corrected when they make an error of judgment. Such corrections improve the conditions of life for all the payers. You will recall that payers must live among the general public since they have no money and no luxuries. Payers cannot escape the sentiments of the public. If the public is unhappy, they will make the payers unhappy. If the public is pleased, the payers will gain all sorts of social rewards informally. So the payers use coordination by mutual consent consensus if you prefer, custom, or even tradition. But they are free to change at any time since no one can command the payers and no payer can control how any other payer decides on payments. The organization will have considerable support in equipment and other resources since the payers are the sole source of all earnings. We have shown that the payers organization is a non-hierarchical bureaucracy which has support from virtually all the productive persons of the population of the, of the economy whether technically citizens of the nation using non-POM or not. Payers will pay anyone who produces causes net benefits. With a little thought, you can see how this might affect POM nation citizens and how they think about and act toward a non-POM economy nation. Therefore, they have the resources, both human and physical, offices, equipment, software, and access, to collect and organize rather complete data from the production of net benefits. Since the payers live and work throughout the population of the nation they are aware of and have brought to their attention harm done to people in the nation. Individuals suffering physical or mental harm are strongly motivated to bring that harm to the attention of the payers since these payers can do something about getting the harm corrected and getting future harm prevented. Those who experience benefits are likewise motivated to bring those benefits to the attention of the payers in order to be sure the payers reward those who provided the benefits. We can, therefore, conclude that the raw data necessary for accurate payments on the basis of net benefits is available to the payers. We have already concluded that the payer organization has the resources to effectively process those data. So all we have left to do is to tidy up this answer to the question of how the payers' bureaucracy and its voting will work is to explain how all those data points are expressed as increases of individuals' account totals. Payers have no luxuries and do not live in luxury neighborhoods. So, when do they come in contact with wealthy people, the so-called movers and shakers of the economy, the people who are in the top 1% of incomes? Obviously, the payers are invited into the executive suites, should there be any such places, to actually observe the high and mighty at work. Unless the payers can observe what the producers in the economy do, they cannot know what to attribute to those producers of benefits and what to attribute to the ordinary workers who don't set policy. Therefore, the payers are present and can observe all aspects of the production cycle of all products and services. For the top executives, 
Each decision is noted for its consequences, since such decisions have a lot of leverage for consequences. For those, a group of payers will vote. They will be randomly selected from the set of payers for that aspect of the economy. The maximum number of such a randomly selected group would be about 2,500, since more than that is not necessary statistically. The decision of this group will relate to what proportion of the consequences of this decision will go to the executive. Note that decisions at a high level have many other factors that contribute to making those decisions, and the outcome or consequences of such decisions. A decision made by a lone executive with little input from others and with little data to go on will be largely credited to that executive, say 80%, whereas a decision made by an executive with considerable input from staff, with the overwhelming consensus of the staff and the supporting data being clear, the credit might be as low as 1% or even less. Likewise, a decision, the success of which is largely dependent on the performance of those carrying out the decision, would garner less credit in that it may be decided that any of a number of different decisions could have achieved results just as good with similar performance by those carrying it out. To put it in sports terms, the decision to have Babe Ruth bat third just before Lou Gehrig, as opposed to Lou batting third and the Babe batting fourth, would not get much credit since the results of either decision depend so much on the performance of the players. In some cases, no matter what you decide, you can't go wrong. Please note that the payers are deciding what proportion of the credit that may or may not result. This particular decision does not credit the executive's account. It produces no amount of money as a judgment. For those who make few broad decisions, such as a worker on an assembly line or a babysitter, the role they play is similarly evaluated for its contribution to consequences. Let's take that babysitter for an example to examine, since I've been doing a lot of babysitting for an infant over the past nine months. There will be a standard pay scale for ordinary infants, which have no special needs. The standard duties would include feeding, changing, diapers, bathing, and lots of holding and conversation with the infant. This pay rate would be based on time spent, since the benefits for people of that age are almost all about the same. Special needs infants, such as those requiring medication or avoiding of allergies, anything requiring extra skilled attention generates a higher rate of pay. For example, cases such as incubator babies, the benefits can be quite high. If special events occur, a home fire, a car wreck, or an accident in the home, the case becomes special and will require a separate payer judgment by one or more payers. Note that the amount of pay depends solely on the benefit not how difficult it was to provide that benefit. If the house catches fire and the sitter carries the babe out long before the fire becomes life-threatening, he or she gets paid the same as the sitter racing through a burning room to carry the baby to safety at the risk of serious injury or death. In fact, if the child is injured by the fire, the sitter loses money that could have been earned. So prevention is more valuable than cure. In the case of the assembly line worker, the contribution evaluation depends on the product. If the product is merely a part of some larger product, like a car seat, then the contribution proportion is for that product. Since the product could be used as a part of any of a number of larger finished products, the final proportion of credit for this worker will vary from larger product to larger product. If one is making nails, for example, they could be used in all sorts of buildings and wooden products. Yet the proportion of credit the nail maker deserves will vary from item to item of consumer goods or capital goods. A product that includes parts produced separately will need to be evaluated for the proportion of credit each part deserves in its contribution to the whole. In a large part product, such as a skyscraper office building, there can be many thousands of parts, both temporary ones that are used in the construction and permanent pieces that become a part of the structure itself which must be allotted a proportion of the credit for the finished building's benefits and harms. Large projects always have harms, if only due to the scale of such projects. As you can imagine, the number of people directly involved in even a large project is dwarfed by the total number of people involved. Each physical object, like nails and cement, is traced back to its raw material stage, and everyone involved in the creation of that object from that point is allocated a proportionate share of the completed project or ongoing project. But that part is relatively simple. The people who contribute to the project directly by their work are themselves supported by others while they are working on the project. 
So providing food or clothing or transportation to such laborers or administrators also gains a proportionate share for that contribution in addition to income earned by providing necessary goods and services to those people. In other words, feeding someone who works and who produces benefits by that work earns more income than feeding a slacker who produces no benefits. But that's not all. Those working on the project were educated, cared for, and provided psychological support in their lives before they ever did anything on the project. Such support also deserves some pay for those who taught and protected and encouraged those workers. Therefore, a large project such as building the interstate highway system might provide income at various levels for a sizable proportion of the adult population of the nation. Those babysitters in year one may get paid 40 years later for taking care of the workers on a project which was generating benefits 40 years later. You may have observed from the above examples that the consequences of one's actions continue forever as far as non-POM is concerned. If you help to educate a child, that gains you a tiny slice of the consequences of that child's later behavior, both good and bad. Thus, seeing that children learn good attitudes is every bit as important as seeing that they learn to read and add. Also, pay is never provided before consequences are known. A major project may take years to complete and begin producing benefits. In the time from the beginning of that project until completion, it will probably do more harm than good. Picture the inconvenience of highway projects, for example, or large buildings. Remember that major construction projects often lead to serious injuries and deaths during the building process. With non-POM, each accident and each injury as it is investigated would result in the harm being apportioned back through the chains of contributors. Now, all these decisions for contributions to the events which comprise benefits and harms to the people of the economy are a part of the computer databases which are the primary tools for the payer organization's determinations. When a benefit or harm is recognized, the credit for that consequence is passed to the computer system by one or more payers, and the benefits are added to the monthly or weekly or whatever pay period pending total for each person. If the harm or benefit generated is a continuing one, such as a family benefits from the home in which they reside, that benefit is automatically a part of the time period's benefits for each person who contributed to the house being available to that family. If a person has suffered an injury, which is in part a consequence of some other person's actions, that other person will have some amount subtracted from the pending benefits for the pay period if the injury has not healed as yet. Of course, the result at the end of the pay period cannot be less than zero. Payers can only increase account totals and can never decrease an account total. But they can reduce future income to zero if the case is severe enough. In such a case, multiple payers would have to confer and agree. Such a decision would never be left to the responsibility of a single payer. Another aspect of payers' evaluations is the permanent ending of benefits. Let's say a house burns or is otherwise destroyed. Those who contributed to the construction of that house will no longer be gaining earnings from that work since the house is no longer providing anyone any benefits. There is no such thing as insurance in a non-POM economy. Of course, this provides incentives to those who build houses to make them resistant to such things as fire, storms, earthquakes, and the mischief of small children. Building something cheap that quickly deteriorates and becomes useless will generate far less earnings, on average, for the suppliers and builders than provision of quality construction built to last. But we are not finished. The payers also need to be sure that all necessary work gets done. So in their allocation of credit for benefits, they must take into account the forces of the free market. If those who provide a necessary part of the work in the economy do not get enough earnings to make it worth their while, there will not be enough people willing to do that sort of work. Thus, a supply and demand situation exists in the allocation of credit for benefits. The payer organization must take such factors into account. Of course, the data necessary to make such judgments is available. The number of people and their production for each work category is readily available via the computer databases. Obviously, for necessary work, the payers must pay enough to generate a sufficient workforce and resources to get that work done, or the economy will collapse. But beyond that, the payers are living in the midst of the general public. If the public wants more of some things and less of other things, they will make that known to the payers, and the payers will also actively seek out such information. If certain products are not being consumed or being consumed last, 
less pay for the production of those products will be like the likely payer response. If some products are just flying off the shelves and distribut distributors run out quickly, more pay for those products would be the logical result. Note that these products can be necessities or capital goods and services as well as luxuries. Thus, we have two free markets, the one between the payers and producers and the other between the consumers and the payers. The latter, between consumers and payers, keeps the former, between payers and produ producers, in line. On each pay period, the computer system will calculate the proportion of the pay period's earnings that should go to each person. Note that we have not yet said anything about the amount of money being added, only the proportion. That is because we don't yet know the total amount of money that can be added for this pay period. That also must be continuously calculated. As each producer generates products, goods and or services, that are designated as luxuries, these products are added to the computer system databases. Each item will be uniquely identified with such things as barcodes and physical properties. Services will be identified by the identity of the persons providing the service and the nature of the service. The prices of these luxuries will be determined by the original cost of production for each subcategory of each item. That is, if we consider a luxury car, its price would be set when the first car of those characteristics was produced. The cost in resources, both human and material, would establish the price which would be fixed for however long that item continues to be produced. At present, the usual course of production of products of any kind is that the earliest copies cost more to produce than later copies. This is due to the greater skill of the producers, improvements in design of the item or the equipment which is used to produce the item, and lower costs for resources. The price of the luxury item remains constant, but the pay to producers increases or changes according to who provides the improvements. Because producing an item with less valuable resources, or with less human effort, or, or which will be safer to produce, increases the net benefits of that production. Therefore, though the price to the consumer remains a constant, the compensation to the producer does change. It is as if the producer was selling at a higher price in a palm-based market. But the information regarding what luxuries have been produced for a given pay period makes possible the calculation of the amount of money it would take to buy all of them. That total amount of money is then multiplied by the proportion of the money each person has earned for that pay period. The amount in non-POM is then credited to the producer's accounts. You will note that an increase in the amount of luxuries produced increases everyone's money earnings. Everyone has a vested interest in more luxuries being produced more efficiently. There are some other factors to be added into the calculation. Some people die. Of those who died, some had accounts and can never spend that money. That money has ceased to exist for all practical purposes. Therefore, that money is added to the money to be credited this pay period. After all, the luxuries exist which that money represented, and they can be bought by living people if those people have sufficient money. Another source of closed accounts, besides those who pass on, is the people who become payers during the pay period. Their money and accounts cease to exist so that that money can also be added to the total available to be paid out. Existing luxury items, which are damaged or destroyed or which are removed from the market by their owners, only one owner per item, must be subtracted from the total to be paid out. Naturally, there will be almost always be quite a lot of unspent money and unbought luxury items and or services. This means that some luxuries may never sell because no one wants them, and some money will not be spent because its owner has no desire for more luxury items. Therefore, there is absolutely no need for the amount of money to exactly match the goods and services for sale. There will always be luxuries to be bought and money available to buy luxuries. The fact that the amount of money in the economy and the value of the backing luxuries are reasonably close is quite sufficient for it all to work smoothly. This is especially true because it is self-correcting rather than being an, in an unstable cycle as with POM during inflation or deflation. With non-POM, inflation and deflation would simply be terms for history lessons, as the use of non-POM does not support or promote those concepts. The preceding describes how data will be collected, processed, and interrelated. That does not cover how the decisions would be made. Those decisions are expected to be made, as needed, by randomly selected groups of payers who share the required background knowledge. If the U.S. economy has 5 million payers, for example, 
one would expect to have thousands of individual payers with knowledge of almost any commonly dealt with subject matter. Therefore, one would never be confident that any particular payer would be involved in making any particular decision. Also, the more important the decision, the larger the number of payers would be. This makes bribery and corruption among the payers virtually impossible, even if such influence could benefit anyone or any group at the expense of everyone else. For example, let's take the case of a producer creating a luxury product. Once produced and a production run completed, the cost of the production would be calculated by a group of payers and that would determine the price for all time for that subcategory of luxury item. Now, should the producer who built the item want the item to have a high price, a low price, or a medium price? Well, that's hard to say. If the price is high, there will be fewer buyers, but the amount of money to be paid for those involved in its production would be high. If the price is low, there will be more potential buyers, but who knows how many, since that depends on a host of factors over which the producer has no control. So what price should the producer hope for? The price that the payers are trying to accurately calculate affects the producer in that he will receive maximum income earned if the payers get that price right. What about a whole industry, like steel for instance? Would those in the steel industry want more pay for those who produce steel? Well, perhaps and perhaps not. More pay means more workers entering that field of production. It means that marginal producers will be supplanted by more productive workers. Less efficient plants will find their steel unused. Also, more expensive steel will give incentives to innovators to find other materials to use in place of steel. In other words, the free market comes into play here as it does in all parts of the non-POM economy. So there really is no good motive to even attempt to bribe or corrupt the payers, and no good means to bring it about, and no way to hide unfair profits. Lots of money acquired but not earned. So much for the vast majority of calculations of earnings. What about the incidental or small-scale things which an individual payer can pay for in actual dollars on the spot? Those payments don't have to have consultation with other payers. They don't require waiting until the total amount of luxuries is calculated at the end of the pay period. They happen on the spot, and the money can be used to buy luxuries as soon as the earner can get to the store or the website of a luxury provider. If a payment is small, there is no need to go through all the above calculations because the total paid out will be such a small part of the pay for that time period. Individual payers can hardly upset the system with such tiny payments, and they can do a lot of good in providing an immediate recognition and reward for small kindly acts, especially with children. Yes, children can earn non-POM just like anyone else. How accurate and fair do the payers have to be? There is actually quite a bit of margin for error without rendering the system inoperable. If each producer knows that they will gain from producing net benefits and will gain proportionately to the amount of benefits produced, the incentives provided by the non-POM will be in play. It is clear that POM functions even though the payments earnings of workers is wildly disproportionate with people being grossly unfairly paid for their contributions to the economy. In fact, much of the most important work being done is not paid at all. How much do we pay a mother for the care she provides her children? How do I know that this is how the payer organization will operate and function? I don't. There's nothing in the non-POM system that requires any of this. But it seems to me that this way of doing things is quite likely to work, and that something at least similar to this would be how things would start out. I would be shocked if the arrangements I've described were followed to the letter, and I would be even more amazed if the way things are done does not change and evolve over time to improve methods and to include improvements and advances in technology. The whole system is quite dynamic and capable of responding rapidly and appropriately to all sorts of alterations and circumstances, and that must include the payer organization.